I'm sure you'll all agree uh, that the public affairs industry performs a crucial role in our democracy and modern society. It's a growing industry, it's a creative industry, it's an industry that is populated with highly talented people. Now, um, I think we're entering a new age of campaigning and lobbying. Um, particularly as seen recently with the incredible campaign win from uh, Captain uh, John Moore uh, and uh, even more recently the influential lobbying success from Marcus Rashford. Now, every single person professionally working in public affairs has a responsibility to uphold the industry's standards, ethical standards and others. Now the zenith of this is embodied in the United Voice of the PRCA Public Affairs Board. The board's role is to ensure transparency through a joint register, enforce high standards through a unified public affairs code, and promote a wider understanding of public affairs and the important contribution it makes to public life. Last month, the PRCA Board approved a more robust public affairs code providing more clarity around the employment of politicians and the use of privileged information. And just nine months ago, the PRCA Public Affairs Board published the results of the first ever public affairs census, um, leading with the headline of public affairs is overwhelmingly London centric, male dominated and young. Um, important issues for the Public Affairs Board to no doubt uh, address in the future. Therefore, for all of these reasons and more, the position of chair of the PRCA Public Affairs Board is one of import and note within the industry and, of course, for the industry. So the three nominees are Emma Patella, co-chair of the PRCA Public Affairs Board Executive Committee and Director at GK Strategy, George McGregor, co-chair of the PRCA Public Affairs Board Executive Committee and chair at Interrail Global Partnership. Liam Herbert, vice chair of the PRCA Public Affairs Board Executive Committee and chief executive at Shellgate. Emma and George are standing on a joint uh, ticket to be co-chairs. Liam is standing on a single ticket to be chair. As the incumbent co-chairs, Emma and George will start with their election statements, a uh, statement, sorry, followed by Liam. Following their statements, we will have a Q&A session. Some questions have been submitted in advance, which I will put to the candidates after both statements have been delivered. If you would like to ask a question, please write it in the chat box as uh, Neha and I will be monitoring this and I will invite you to ask your question at the appropriate moment. Candidates will be given a few minutes to answer each question. If I feel that it's taking longer, I will uh, ask, ask them to draw their question to a close. Um, so, without uh, further ado, I suggest we get started. Um, and Emma and um, George, would you like please to deliver your statement? I'm going to kick off. Thank you very much, Gavin. Excellent introduction and thank you for doing this today. We really appreciate it. Pleasure. Um, I, I want to begin by thanking the many members of the Public Affairs Board who've nominated Emma and myself. Uh, in total, we were very flattered, in total about 10% of the entire membership have nominated us and the nominations have come from large members, small members, they've come from specialist consultancies, they've come from in-house and they've come from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. We really are flattered and one of the things we've always believed in is that the Public Affairs Board isn't just a big London company, it's made up of many constituent parts. So, when Matt and I were elected a year ago as four chairs, it was just after the APC PRC merger. And in the words of Mrs. Merton, we had quite a huge debate around that time. Um, and one of the reasons we want to become co-chairs is because Emma and I took different positions on the on the merger. I was in favour of the merger. Emma had her reservations. And we thought what was needed at the time was a coming together 
to refocus the organisation on the key priorities that members really cared about. And that's really what we've sought to do over the past year. We took into our co-chairman's role three priorities. I'm going to deal with the first and Emma will deal with the, the second two. And we've carried forward these priorities during the past year and we're seeking the chance to, to do it again. Number one priority, first and foremost, is to ensure ethical public affairs. It's absolutely key to what we do. Um, Emma and I have been fearless in, in pursuing that goal. And sometimes that's meant standing up to powerful interests and powerful people. I well recall when Ruth Davidson, um, who I respect politically, um, tried to simultaneously become an elected member of the Scottish Parliament and a paid lobbyist. Well, we called Ruth Davidson out. We didn't just do it once, we did it again and we did it again and we worked very closely with our Scottish members and we eventually got her to do a U-turn. So we're fearless in standing up for ethical public affairs. But we're also fearless in ensuring that the public affairs code is strong, is updated and is enforced. Because unless we have a strong public affairs code, which is updated and enforced, then this industry will face draconian legislation from government. We need a strong code as a buffer to stop that. I'm sure we'll get into the code during the discussion, but I'm going to pass over to Emma now. Thank you. Thanks, George. Uh, and yeah, just to whisper, one of the reasons George and I were really keen to stand was because we do come from the different sides of the merger debate, uh, but we were both hugely united in making the merger work. And I think we've spent the last year working with a really excellent executive committee, which has had really good representation from large members, small members, in-house and agency from across all the different regions and nations. And I think it's really important for George and I um, that the Public Affairs Board is a member-led organisation. And what we mean by that, it needs to be fully representative of the whole industry. So those large members, medium members, small members in-house um, and reflected across all the nations and regions. It has to have a really clear and well-respected code and it has to have an independent complaints process which we have in CEDA um, and for us backing that up is being incredibly uh, professional secretariat service that the PRCA has, has allowed us to have um, and I think we've seen some really good examples of that enhanced stability over the past year with um, our ability to act in the media um, and enhanced training and, and lots of other areas as well. Um, I think the first year has been a, there have been a lot of successes and there have also been some growing pains which was really inevitable as a result of two organisations coming together um, but this, this for you, last year and for the, for the year ahead um, getting more members involved in the work of the Public Affairs Board would be really key to us um, and uh, we stood for one year which means we can only stand for one more year I think for both, you know, both George and I we feel there's a little bit of unfinished business we feel like that we've done some really good things um, and we're really keen to be able to, to get more members involved and really um, promote all of our area, the areas of importance across the whole membership base and really get as much engagement as possible. The final priority and probably one that George and I most feel really passionate about is about promoting diversity. Uh, you know, ensuring public affairs reflects the society that we live in it, it is so important and a real personal priority for both of us. It's one of the reasons we wanted to stand together. I'm obviously a woman, George is a, a gay man, and we both work in and lead uh, businesses. Um, and for us, getting leading by example is, is really key and be having that the kind of face of public affairs as, as open and welcoming to as many new people as possible. Um, is, and from a personal perspective, having lots of particularly younger women looking to, to get into the profession and um, women looking to move into leadership roles. I've had contact me over the past year and I found that truly rewarding. So um, I'd love to have more of an opportunity to, to do that as well. Um, working with the executive committee, we put in place a, a year long activity plan on diversity uh, and special thanks go out to Tiffany Burroughs from Newington who was on the executive committee and was really brilliant in leading that work stream. And as part of that, we're really proud to have made um, quite a few uh, headways. We promoted the Tate of Unconscious Bias training, and there's a lot more we want to do on that, so watch the space. Uh, we encouraged the adoption of diversity and inclusion guidelines. We supported the PRC School Outreach Programme, 
uh, we've increased the visibility of public affairs professionals from underrepresented groups and we've worked closely with some really great organisations including Women in Public Affairs and Intercoms. And as I say there's still so much more we, we want to do and so much more to do um, and we would love to have the opportunity uh, over the next year to really continue to push forward that work programme with some excellent uh, people on, on, in the industry and on the executive committee. Uh, so uh, to sum up, because I'm aware of timing, don't want to go on too long, uh, this would be our final year. Um, both George and I, I think are, are remain ambitious and passionate for the Public Affairs Board and we see it as a, a key and really important and credible organisation um, and one that has so much good to do um, and we do feel that we work well together. I personally really enjoy working with George, we have a good partnership. Uh, and we, we love working with everyone in the industry as well. So uh, thank you and yeah, look forward to welcoming questions. George, uh, Emma, thank you both very much. Liam. Thanks, Go Kevin. It's, um, yeah, it's, been, it's been a year um, and it's been a good couple of years whilst we've gone through the, the negotiations and the, the, the the growth of the, the PRCA Public Affairs Board as it emerged with the APPC. And we made great progress as a committee over the last year. Um, as George and Emma have said, there have been quite a lot of um, significant wins out of that. And, and as they both said, some, some interesting um, engagement as we, we bring two organisations together to kind of create one voice for the industry. Um, and I think one of the things that collectively we've done over the year is actually demonstrate the value of having one in one voice across the industry. And I think we've got a really good platform now to continue a lot of the work programs that we were set in motion last year um, and to focus down on perhaps now a little bit more um, outward focus in our activity. We've, we've, we've looked at internally, we've strengthened our code, we've had a consultation on that. We've tightened up on some of the areas in terms of um, uh, MP and um, uh, Lords um, appointments. Um, as George said, we've been robust in defending the position of um, ethical lobbying. And as always, any kind of disputes on lobbying have not actually involved real lobbyists, but politicians um, broadly trying to go rogue during the year. Um, and I think we need to bring more focus onto ethical lobbying and we need to bring all the ethical lobbyists with us into a bigger, wider organisation. We've, um, we've got an opportunity now to broaden our roots into industry so that we, we can represent and we can be the voice of, of the public affairs industry. <coughs> um, core to that has to be working through some of the programmes that started from there. And diversity and inclusion is a core element of that. Um, we need to support and create career opportunities, not just um, within the industry now, but at the outset. And, and the concept that lobbying and public affairs is a career that people can aspire to, but also understand that it's actually a career that's open to them, or it's a career that they may never even have come across because their life experience hasn't brought them into contact with politics in the way that that it has for many of us in, in, in the roles that we perform today. So we, we need to work hard on that much more during the year. Um, we need to work harder also to make sure that this is not just Westminster centric. And it's very easy to be a London centric organization because so much stuff happens in London. Um, and I think one of the strengths that, um, that we need to build on next year is actually how we, work in the regions much more and how that embeds much more with the with the PRCA network that already exists out there. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a hard task to rely on people to do this voluntarily as we do um, as committee members and what we can do to provide resources and money and support behind not just the, uh, the Westminster end but particularly into the regions and nations. That's, that's where we need, to, we need to put a bit of a focus in there. Um, completely agree on standards. We need to be robust on standards, compliance with the code of conduct. Um, we've, as I said, we've gone through the, the consultation on making that more robust, tidying up some of the, the language around vague interpretation of what or what isn't 
constituting public affairs activity. Um, we need to go out and, and stand up behind that now. We need to promote that actively. And we need to promote that actively throughout the membership and encourage membership. Because we need to make, if we're going to be successful as the voice of the industry, we need to make what we do relevant to the lives of practitioners. Uh, and to do that, we need to we need to get into much more of the organisations, be much more member focused, and encourage the teams within member organisations to understand how and what we do and how they can play a part in it. Um, as George and Emma said, they, they are, their, their opportunity to stand for one more year. We're, we're we're a bunch of old people, relatively. Um, uh, you know, we need to be starting thinking what comes out of this generation. To come and the generations before that, because this will be, as, as Gavin outlined at the outset, we're in, in, a, in a marketplace where um, traditional lobbying, which if you listen to Radio 4 this morning, involves apparently signing up and going to Tory fundraising dinners because then you can speak to ministers or councillors about planning applications, that's great. But as, as we look at what's been doing with um, online campaigning, digital campaigning, and the, the kind of crowd-focused element. You know, we, we have a role there in, in encouraging and developing that because anything that gets a voice of people in democracy to lawmakers is what we're about. Um, those of you who don't know me, I've been around for more years than I'm ever going to admit, and in and out of the PRCA, starting out in my early days doing consumer PR, but we gloss over that because that was a tawdry episode and um, I'm, 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 a, I'm always passionate about lobbying I'm always very proud to say I'm a lobbyist and I work in public affairs but I also find I spend a lot of my time explaining what lobbyists do and also defending the position that all the things that people think lobbyists do aren't the things that lobbyists do but they're the things that that happen in a, in a, in a corrupt business environment so I would, again, we're back to standards, we're back to the voice, we're back to engaging with the regulator. Um, we already have achieved a position which is brilliant, where the, the PRCA code is recognised as being the standard that the industry should be judged by. We need to work hard to make that become reality. Um, I'm not going to say much more. I'm more interested in see what people have got to say. And I've seen some of the questions flipping up, so I'll, I'll hand back to Gavin and we'll, we'll crack on. Thank you, Liam, um, and thank you, everyone. So I'd like to start then with the questions that have been submitted in advance. We've got three. Um, the first two are, have been submitted uh, anonymously. Um, I don't think that gives any, indi there's no, uh, no indication of um, uh, the question itself, but um, they are nonetheless anonymous. Um, the first uh, I will ask and I'll invite all three candidates please to to answer each question uh, before we move on to the next um, and uh, I suggest we start again in the same in the same order uh, in terms of answering the questions but uh, I may may well mix that up as we go along uh, in a bid in a bid for fairness um, now so the first question is what are your views on the statutory register for consultant lobbyists and how would you handle the relationship with the registrar? So just to repeat, what are your views on the statutory register for consultant lobbyists and how would you handle the relationship with the registrar? Gordon Emma. Maybe I'll start. Emma and I won't... Um answer each question we will kind of divide it between ourselves because we want to give equal time to Tilliam. Um, Oracle is a joke, it's an absolute joke. I've, I've looked at different lobbying, statutory lobbying registration schemes across the world and I think Oracle is probably the poorest of them all. However, it exists and we've got to adhere to it and we've got to try and improve it. We've, we've met with Harry Rich, who's the registrar, um, on a number of occasions. We've had conversations with him and I think we've won Harry Rich, the, the registrar, around to the position of recognising that the PRCA Public Affairs Board code is the best code of them all and when he introduced changes this year he, he kind of recognised that in those changes and was, was in effect actively encouraging people who are on the Oracle Register 
to abide by the Public Affairs Board code. So my direct answer to your question is, I think the code is a, you know, the regime is a joke. We have to adhere to it. We have to have professional relations and we seek to improve it where possible. One, one of our colleagues on the call, Tom from Cicero, led a group within the board this year to look at uh, lobbying regulation. That work is continuing. And I think what we need to do as a board is come up with a, a practical alternative regime should the occasion arise where the government decides to look at lobbying regulation. I'm not saying that we want to actively promote a change to the Oracle regime, but we need to be ready just in case. Thank you, George. Liam. Um, Oracle is an example of what bad regulation um, results in, um, and it comes from badly informed implementation of bad regulation, uh, because it doesn't answer the question that it was originally founded to, 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 to deal with, which is how do you, how do you regulate uh, and how do you control and how do you demonstrate transparency in lobbying? And um, one of its key failures is that it's the register of consultant lobbyists. So it completely and utterly misses the point of um, the, the lobbying sector and doesn't include a huge swathe of people that it should. Now, having said that, and as George said, we have to work with it. Um, the, the, the recognition that the PRCA, PAB code, the code of conduct is, is, a, uh, is a stronger and more transparent um, vehicle is excellent. And this is where uh, the, I mean, the regulator is the regulator, so he has to implement the the, uh, the legislation as it stands. So, whilst he has a limited scope of, of what he can do, we need to maintain positive relationships there because uh, I don't see anyone coming to regulate in a Westminster perspective very soon. Um, but we need to be building the relationships on, as we said, on, on all sides of the house in terms of what lobbying is about. And it's back to why ethical lobbying stands out for that. And it's about presenting that on that basis. It's about also defending and being seen to defend our codes so that um, external uh, criticism can't come from a, uh, a position where Oracle is saying, well, you, you have a code, but you're not really enforcing it. So I think there, there are a couple of things there, really. We're, we're back to Always, always defending and maintaining a strong position on our code of conduct, and we're also about, as we say now, we, we've, we've had a year of, of getting ourselves in order. We now need to be out there promoting what it is we do, why we do it, and why it's important. Thank you, Liam. Our second question um, submitted in advance is this. How would you enforce and maintain ethical standards across the public affairs industry? How would you enforce and maintain ethical standards across the public affairs industry? Um, if I'm right in thinking then, Emma, uh, this will be a question that you will answer. Thank you, yeah. Um, I think obviously enforcing and maintaining standards is, is one of the, the biggest roles and priorities of the Public Affairs Board and it's something that's so important linking back in their regulators now and in future and you know, have confidence that the code is of a high quality and that it is enforced where there are breaches of the code. We've been very clear that, that it's really important that we have a member-led organisation and what we mean by that is a real diverse range of people around uh, the executive committee who are informing and continually improving the code as as the industry changes and grows it's important that the code is is kept up to date and as part of that we uh, we committed to annual reviews of the code um, it's something that we did in the former APPC days when I was part of the APPC and it's something that um, we've continued as post-merger uh, and I think that works well and we've seen some really good uh, examples of enhan enhanced code recently. In terms of enforcement, where there are concerns around complaints, we're really passionate about having that independent complaints process, CEDA, as the organisation that looks at and assesses uh, the complaint and comes up with recommendations based on their findings, which the executive committee would then look at 
um, and impose sanctions accordingly dependent on the findings of CEDA. So it's the role of the executive committee to uh, listen to the membership and listen to uh, feedback to enhance the code where required um, and then where there are complaints, CEDA, the independent body, look at it, adjudicate it and then the executive committee look at the recommendations and deal with the sanctions accordingly. That is the process that has been set out. Uh, I think we both, uh, George and I, really agree with that process. It's a fair process. Um, we're doing as much as possible to make sure we're increasing training on the code so that organisations are aware um, of what their requirements are as part of the code. Um, and if then there are breaches, we have faith in CEDA as an independent process and body that understand the code well, can look at it and come up with the fair uh, findings. Um, so that would be, I think, the process we followed and, and one we would continue to follow. I think that um, one of the, the main learnings from this year and one that the executive committee were really keen on towards the end of the year was really increasing the level of training um, and giving more detail around certain aspects of the code where they're more likely to be grey areas. Um, and that's something that we would commit to doing more of. And we've been really pleased by the, the professionalization of the training over the last year and, and hope to do more, particularly now we're in this online world where everyone is no longer afraid of dialing into a, a webinar or anything anymore. So um, we will take advantage of that. Thank you, Emma. Um, so Liam, uh, how would you enforce and maintain ethical standards across the public affairs industry? I think we've demonstrated this year that we that we are enforcing and, um, and maintaining ethical standards and where we've identified that there are um, potentials to misinterpret either deliberately or accidentally the code we've we've consulted on that and we've come back with with stronger and more robust language around that I think one of the one of the benefits out of the the coming together of the two organizations is that we're now also part of this ethical professional code driven um organization that the prca has from a, from a uh, personal membership uh code of conduct to the specific lobbying code of conduct so we have we have roots to uh, maintain integrity and ethical behavior across the piece so even if uh, even if um, activities don't breach code conduct from a public affairs point of view, there's also an opportunity to see how people are behaving and operating as a practitioner and professional and what are the codes across the PRCA impact on them. I think the, the process that we have is, is robust. Um, we, we've, we've worked our way through some of the uh, the, the kind of teething pains of bringing the two elements of, a, of the APPC code and the, PA, and the PRCA code together and how that's implemented and, and driven through. And I think we have, a, as Emma said, we've got a, a strong, clear and independent process now that comes back. It's backed by um, having taken action. It's backed by the PRCA who will be active and always active in responsible ethical behaviour. Um, I think it's incumbent on all of us to uh, promote that. I think it's incumbent upon all of us within our organisations to inculcate that within the teams that we operate. And training is key to that, but training not just within code compliance, but in terms of ethical and professional behaviour across the piece. So again, we're back to how do we make membership relevant to the practitioner and what is important to it and what do they get? Because what do they get from behaving ethically and from adhering to the code? Then maintaining the standard and taking action when people are breaching it. There's, you know, they they need to be able to standing up in a commercial environment. If I want a better description, say we operate in this way. This is what our standards are. We're transparent and we're ethical about it. Others may not be the case. This is how we work, and that's where that's where we we win every time. I think. Thank you, Liam. So our third question um, is uh, was submitted. Third and uh, final question that was submitted in advance is from uh, Tom Tom Frackowak from Cicero, uh, who we've got here with us in the live audience. So Tom, would you like to ask your question um, of the uh, of the candidates and uh, George, uh, <coughs> assuming the swap uh, continuing between you and Emma, would you like to uh, answer first? 
Thanks a lot, Gavin. Um, uh, I, I don't need a, a long answer for this because actually the candidates have covered a lot of what have I, what, a lot of what I've asked. Uh, I slightly disagree with the comments around um, when we look at ethical lobbying, the issues are with politicians and not with the industry. I noted the names of two consultants in the tablet in the papers today. Uh, so we're under ever increasing scrutiny. Um, and therefore, my question is, how will you, if you are elected as chair, um, continue to ensure that the Public Affairs Board continues to champion ethical um, public affairs? And do you have the independence to pursue this agenda? Thank you, Gavin. Uh, George, we can't hear you. I don't know if it's just me. Sorry about that. Yeah, I put, put you Thank you. I was being polite. Um, in relation to the, the, the current story concerning Genric, I, I think what's, what's hardly been noticed is a lobbying company called Thorncliffe, um, which I've not come across before because I don't work in the, the planning side of things, but they are the public affairs advisors. And when I read the weekend press, I was, a little, I was mortified that they're their, their exaggerated claims. And I think any 22 year old who would go in the PRCA Public Affairs Board training would know that one of the key things you should not be doing that is completely unethical is to make exaggerated claims. So I've got no knowledge of their role in this whole affair, but I am aware of the exaggerated claims that have been um, denounced or, or repudiated by the parties involved. I think it, we just need to stick with the basics. You know, we have a we have a strong code. We need to improve it as time goes on. We need to enforce it. And if there is a breach of the code, we need to ensure there are sanctions. And I think we should approach the, the whole of this process. The board should approach the whole of this process next year in the same way that it's done last year. It should be without fear or favour. You know, we, you look at the facts, you evaluate on, on, the, on the facts, and then you take appropriate action. I think it's not about being policemen. We're not policemen. We are the custodians of the code and the champions of the code. Thank you, George. Liam, would you like to uh, address that question? Yeah, thanks, Tom. I guess there's two different parts to this, one of which is we we can act and we can we can take action against people who are our members and we've done that and we've talked a lot about that over the last few minutes and we should continue to do that um we should we should ensure that the process is and and this goes for all the PRCA complaints process we should ensure that people don't feel intimidated by bringing complaints against members um it can be it can be a daunting thing to do particularly if you're a, a, a junior member of an organisation, you know, so we need to make we need to make sure that that's you know, that's it, there's there's an opportunity for that not to be intimidating for them not to feel that it could be damaging to them in any way, shape, or form, and we should be, as George says, robust in our implementation. When it comes to people who aren't members, um, and this is this is a, a kind of public, private kind of element to this. If it's a member who we believe has committed a breach, we need to be broadly careful about how we respond to that in a, in a media sense, because we are, as a board, we are the final arbiter on the investigation. So we can't necessarily be a prosecutor and a, you know, and a jury in that position. So we need to be circumspect in, in, in how we call that out. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't be robust in how we position ourselves in the code. When it comes to people who are non-members and are behaving in a deeply unethical way, um, and I'm aware of Thorncliffe's uh, involvement in the general business and their general approach to um, uh, property lobbying at best, that's, a, that's actually broadly a, a, a great opportunity for us to exploit as to why people should be members, why it's important, why transparency is important, and, what, and, and condemning them from that basis there. because. Again, we're back to this point of why, as a member, should I be a member of this if other people are getting away with it and they're not paying their money and they're not doing what they need to do? So, and this this is back to the regulation side. You know, there, there needs to be there needs to be sanctions, and until we broaden our membership and until we're out and can legitimately stand up and say the people on the fringes of this are not 
representative of the industry and we are the industry that's where that's the position we need to be getting to so that that's that's it for me really you know, on that basis we, we have a robust code we have a good structure we're, in, we're within and part of a broader organization that stands for ethical standards across the entire um, PR and PA profession and that's as, as an organization we need to be calling that out whether it's public affairs or whether it's public relations Thank you, Liam. Um, I'm going to uh, move to the questions now from um, the audience that are being posted on the chat. Um, there are a couple of other themes that have come up, but just before we move on to them, um, given this particular theme of questioning, uh, I'd like to go to Gavin Devine, please. Uh, Gavin, will you please ask your question uh, on the subject of uh, potential future interventions? And uh, Liam, sorry, sorry, Gary, and Liam, uh, as you haven't answered, been the first to answer a question yet, will you be the first to answer this question, please? Uh, and then um, I think it will be over to um, George. No, Emma. It's a genuine uh, inquiry, really. There's been a lot of talk about uh, uh, us facing additional uh, regulation and scrutiny from government. I was just wondering what the likelihood of that was and how, in practice, the candidates would address it. We're already facing scrutiny um, and regulation from government, but important. And that's one of the things that we need to be engaged with. You know, and we have been engaged with through, um, through the committee during the year, um, and particularly with John, but we need to be engaged much more in that. Because again, we need to stop thinking about the public affairs business being a Westminster business. Uh, what the worst parts of regulation come about when people pick and choose because they see other things working in other jurisdictions. So whilst we need to defend hard and, and position ourselves well in Scotland, it also then positions ourselves with the regulator in, the, in, in England on that basis. Um, and as George has already intimated earlier, we are, we've started having better conversations with the regulator and we need to do that on a much more regular basis. Uh, we, we need to be much more outward focusing generally. We need to be engaging with, um, and we talked a little bit about this last year, but we need to be engaging with politicians in a gentle way at this stage because we don't actively want them to encourage or think about they, they should be encouraging about any further changes to regulation, um, but we need to be demonstrating our value and our worth and the the work that um, the committee started last year on the value of public affairs stands behind that and that's something we should be looking at you know, next year as well in terms of what we do with the PRCA public affairs conference the value that we bring the worth that this is in this, this industry has um, because bad regulation is made in a vacuum and that's that's you know, that's the situation we appear to be facing in, in Scotland and we need to be defending that quite hard I think in, in, the, in, you know, in the, the UK regulator, I can't see an appetite at the moment, um, given everything that we've gone through with Brexit and um, COVID-19, of anybody dramatically on the, the government side wanting to think about enhancing or furthering government regulation. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be prepared. Yeah. Thank you. Emma. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think Liam's right in saying one of the, the main part, one of the core uh, agenda items of every um, executive committee meeting is looking at regulation and um, we have a working group on that um, and obviously Scotland uh, and getting updates on what's happening there has been probably one of the bigger priorities uh, but also looking in Wales and Northern Ireland as well and Westminster. Um, in terms of the immediacy of regulation I think Scotland is obviously the most kind of pressing um, there but as we see, you know, on, on an almost monthly basis at the moment, new things coming out in the in the media, we have to be aware of the ability of government, as we'll all know as public affairs practitioners, to sometimes kind of knee-jerk reaction and try and make changes to regulation as a result of, you know, all it would take is one big scandal for, for some potentially um, significant change. So as, a, as an executive body and as a public affairs board, uh, we have to do everything that we can do to make sure that the code is seen to be robust and enforced um, and also that we are uh, we are broadening membership and uh, and getting as many people under the code as possible 
Um, one of the key work streams that we worked on this year was the value of public affairs report and we're still committed to that. It should be being published over the course of this year. Um, and that is a real comprehensive look at the public affairs industry. And what does that look like? What's its value? I think often in the past, uh, we've not been as great at kind of PRing ourselves as we often are for our clients. Um, and therefore, um, the, pub, the value of public affairs report is a real attempt to, uh, to be for us as, as, as a sector, to be really proud of what we contribute to the UK. Um, and actually particularly interested in light of COVID as well to see how that may, how kind of the sector may have changed. And um, so it's some really interesting things there and, and that will be a great piece for us to then use for further engagement. So as George mentioned earlier, um, you know, we know Harry at Oracle well, uh, we knew Alison before and, um, and whilst yes, uh, kind of the, uh, there is a lot of room for improvement around the, the current regulatory uh, regime. There's obviously kind of better the devil you know in some ways and, um, and further regulation that could hamper the industry is not, is not um, desirable at this stage. So maintaining a good relationship there, continuing to promote the value of what we do um, and making sure that we're getting that across to as many different stakeholders. We've met with the cabinet office on a number of occasions and we're, we also have met with uh, members of the different political parties as well um, to make sure that we're, we're, we're educating and um, on the code and, uh, and the industry and, and the, the work that we're doing and also making the different the differentiation between those organizations that are with sit within the code and do um, do follow the code and those that don't which um, are often the ones that that come in for criticism not always but are often the ones that come in for, for criticism in the media so um, for us continuing to champion our code get more people into it continue to train and, and to educate within the membership but also more broadly those political stakeholders and regulatory stakeholders not just in Westminster but in Scotland Wales and Northern Ireland as well it is a real uh, priority over the next year Thank you, Emma. Um, before we move on to two other topics, um, I'd like to just bring uh, uh, in Lionel Zetta. Uh, the two other topics um, are on the subject of regions and um, diversity and inclusion. But before we bring this particular one on codes and regulation to a close, um, Lionel, you have made um, a statement and uh, posed a question in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, is that something that you'd like to um, pose now to the candidates? Thank you, Gavin. Um, yeah, I had the uh, honour to chair PRCA Public Affairs um, and I brought to that role, I think the same attitude that I brought to my professional role, which is that most things are best sorted out face to face and quietly. Uh, I had a very good relationship with the previous registrar and as a result so did the PRCA PA. I never made any public comments about the suitability or otherwise of Orkle and I was rather surprised when George called Orkle a joke. Uh, I think we need to have a civil relationship with Orkle and we need to move them quietly in the direction that we would like to see. Um, I would, I would be George, very, yes, would you like to respond to that? I, I would very much so. I called the Oracle regime a joke and I stand by it. I think it's an inadequate regime and I think if you were to ask Harry Rich, he would probably agree. Um, he's trying to do a difficult job and he's doing that job well. Emma and I have got a very good relationship with Harry Rich. We've met him on a number of occasions. We've been on platforms together. We've introduced him to members and at all times we've acted extremely professionally. That does not mean that the regulatory regime is fit for purpose. It's clearly not. When I, when I have to, for my own company, when I have to fill in the quarterly return, I, I know that I'm providing meaningless information which has been put into the public domain. It's probably the worst uh, um, statutory registration scheme there is of any that I've ever come across. And, you know, I will tell it as it is, and of course, at the same time, always being professional. Liam, would you anything? Would you like to respond to Lionel? Uh, no, I, 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 I kind of, I, I guess, Lionel's saying broadly what good lobbyists always say. Um, when I got my Oracle registration reminder this morning, which kind of underlines 
the pointlessness of, of, of this particular um, regime. Um, I, I think I think there's there's I think the, the difference comes in what we say publicly and what we say within the family. And within the family, as George says, and I, I agree with George, this is a pointless piece of regulation. Um, it doesn't necessarily behove as well to call that out in, in public, and I don't think that we've we've done that or should do that. Partly because if we stand up and do that, that prompts the punitive action particularly against us because oh if you don't think that's bad enough let's see what else we can do so i entirely agree with um lionel's position about you know, quietly winning people over which i think you know, we've done some work with that on this year with, with the uh, with the uh, regulator and i think that's that's the way forward because that's what we do as, as public affairs professionals we spend our time explaining the law of unintended consequences to either clients or politicians you know be careful how you work wish for because this is what happens if you play that scenario out and we need to work at that but we need to work at that once we have you know, built on the credibility we've already established we're already there with our code being recognized as a as, as the standard that people should aspire to we need to work on that so that we have more people covered under the umbrella of that code. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to move on to cover because we've got um, uh, sort of 10 minutes left. Um, there are two other topics that have come up in the questions, um, which I'd like to move us on to, please. Um, let's start with um, the first one around um, engaging with the nations uh, and a review of the Lobbying Act in Scotland. Um, on the subject of the regions uh, and the devolved assemblies, um, Liam, would you like to go first? And Emma, would you like to then follow? The question, though, is from John Morrison. John, um, if you're here, would you like to uh, add anything to that topic? Yes, I am here. Thanks very much. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that, um, that the candidates talk about uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland before. I'm uh, slightly concerned that they've been described as regions, but uh, that's just a point from Scotland. But uh, the, the question to the candidates is, how do they propose to engage with the nations and the, the parliaments and assemblies? And specific reference to the review of the Lobbying Act in Scotland, which is coming up. Thank you. Liam. Thanks, John. Um, I, I think as a, at, the, at the outset, we, we've made some steps in this, but we need to be much more um, involved. And uh, you, we, we've discussed this, uh, we've discussed this over the year. It's very difficult to rely on the goodwill and the, the, the time of volunteers like yourself and like Cathy in Wales um, to to drive forward an agenda and to respond to an agenda that's happening in, in, in the nations there. So this requires us to deploy more resources and more capability from PRCA and we have the, the financial resources to do that and we have the, the personnel to do that. Um, it provides, and I think that, that needs to be beefed up much more over the next year, particularly in response to um, the the regulation coming forward in Scotland because we need to treat it uh, we need to treat dealing with regulations we would treat any kind of client campaign we need to we need to work on it and have a campaign and a program to support that not just simply rely on rely on our own goodwill to get these things done so we need to exploit it in those ways and, I, and that's one of the things that we need to secure much more with the uh, PRCA next year and the PRCA Secretariat is as well with the PRC at the end of the day. But in terms of members, we need to drive forward and, and ensure that we get the share of the resources and the capability and, ex, and, and exploit the network that the PRC has established in these, uh, you know, around the UK in terms of how we do this. Um, that's, that's broadly my position. I think, really. Thank you. Emma? Well, I'm actually going to, um, I know George will shout at me if I don't give him the opportunity to talk about Scotland, of which he feels very passionate. So I'll pass this one to George and I'll take the next one. <laughs> 
I think you muted, George. I muted, I'm polite again. In terms of Scotland, um, I'm not just taking this one because I've got a Scottish accent, um, but I spent 10 years working in Scotland as a policy and research officer, and I lobbied the Scottish Parliament. So I know directly both lobbying the Scottish Parliament um, from Edinburgh and also lobbying it from London, just how different it is. And because of that awareness, I'm also aware of how different things are in Wales and even more different in Northern Ireland. And I think it's, uh, it's been a real priority for us to ensure that the voices from the nations and regions are, held, are, are heard. Uh, I've been up to Scotland on a number of occasions to meet the members. Um, and we've got a meeting with the members planned in a couple of weeks time to talk about the forthcoming review of the lobbying rules in Scotland, which are much more coherent uh, than the Westminster, it should be added. And it will be extremely important during that review that we do not end up with a draconian set of rules and regulations coming in from the Scottish Parliament. So I think we, one of the things I've noticed that's different from the APPC days to the, the Public Affairs Board days is that the voices of the nations are heard much more clearly. We always in the APPC had a Scottish representative. I think it's brought a real strength to the Public Affairs Board that we have voices from Wales and Northern Ireland and long may that continue. Thank you, George. Um, so we've got uh, quite a, there's quite a lot of interest um, in the issue of diversity and inclusion. We've had all three candidates, uh, each in their way, address and raise this topic. Um, and there are a number of people supporting as well Francis O'Leary's question. Um, Francis, would you like to ask your question? Um, Emma, would you like to go first? And Liam, would you please follow? Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks all. I'm Fran O'Leary. Um, yeah, we've heard a bit about diversity and inclusion already so far, but I think it would be really useful and informative to hear what the candidates' plans are for the future on diversity and inclusion, what the action plans are and what you plan to do next. Sure, thanks, Fran. Um, yeah, as, as we kind of mentioned in the opening, promoting diversity and inclusion is, is really important to us. And I think it's it's you know now more than ever as a as a sector we have so much to do and um, it, and so much progress still to make. I think over the last year we've we've really um, made some ground on it. Um, and as I mentioned again, thank you so much to Tiff for the work that she's done in leading a a really excellent uh, group of the of the executive committee on this. And that's been really broad reaching in what it's looked at. Uh, and our, our strategy has been and will continue to be to work collaboratively with other organizations in the space who are already doing lots here because we we always said kind of you know it's such a huge issue where do we start and how do we make most progress so we've had some great um joint events meetings uh, and programs that we've done with women in public affairs um, and intercoms we really want to continue to do that and bring in more organizations and do more um, there as well we've got uh, an as part of the working group that working group is continuing um, and Tiff was emailing just yesterday asking for sign off um, to do some more in terms of the unconscious bias training and that's something that both George and I feel really passionate about and you know we, we've made commitments within our own organisations on this agenda and we're encouraging as many people to do that as possible. We've always given it a key uh, role in every um, public affairs board that we do so it's, it's on the agenda at every executive committee meeting, we look at action so we like to make sure that we're taking things forward we're not just a, a kind of a bit of a talking shop which I think we recognize at the start of the year often can be the case when talking about diversity and inclusion people spend a lot of time talking but not necessarily acting so we've always been really clear that we want to act and we want to lead by example um, and we'll we'll continue to do that by um, continuing to support and endorse um, different initiatives the PRCA has its own diversity and inclusion group and we've taken on and, and are supporting those including kind of schools outreach and, and others um, and 
but we want to welcome as many different people or from different backgrounds onto the executive committee so the elections for the executive committee are coming up a really important part of that will be promoting uh, the different um, different faces of the public affairs board and of the sector and trying to encourage a broader more diverse range of people onto the executive committee so that we really can be uh, a credible uh, organization that is leading by example and then taking forward uh, lots of amazing ideas uh, and initiatives and um, so yeah we feel really passionate about it we're always willing to uh, to listen to people we've had some great conversations and we've met lots of really great people over the past year and and yeah long, long may that continue thank you emma liam would you like to address fran's um question yeah sounds, I'm just getting unmuted um yeah, it's, it's been an interesting year uh, coming together and, and diversity, is, as Emma said, has been a, one of the core work streams of that. I think the, the positioning is perhaps where we have an opportunity to, to take a lead a little bit because this is, this, is, this is bigger than the Public Affairs Board. This is a PRCA activity and the PRCA is putting a lot of time, effort and resources into this. Um, and with, 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 uh, and with the new panel that has been launched in uh, the last couple of weeks, as well as the availability of training, uh, we already do uh, unconscious bias training is already available through a PRCA training course. I think as a public affairs board, we have two functions here, one of which is to actively engage and support the broad, broader diversity uh, agenda that the PRCA is pushing. But we also have an opportunity to demonstrate why there are certain idiosyncrasies and differences in what we do as, as professional practitioners and how that impacts on diversity. But it also gives us an opportunity to lead uh, and be at the vanguard of some of the things that the PRCA are doing because we're a smaller group of people within a larger organisation. So we can actually organise ourselves and corral ourselves much, much faster and be fleet of foot around these things. And I think for me, that's where this stands is. Um, is actually been much more proactive as part of a larger campaigning organisation, but with a vision about how this impacts particularly on our sector. Because again, we're back to this issue of how do we encourage people to join? How do we encourage people to demonstrate that they've got benefit out of their membership? And how do we build um, the, the, the career paths for people in the future? You know, the, the people I speak to, um, in, uh, in in the kind of schools and sixth form colleges in these in East London, where my partner works, they have no concept of how public affairs works, what it is as a career, how it's even a career. You know, the number of people who, who you know, talk to me about the concept that so you get paid for going and talking to people, but you don't actually do anything is is where a lot of these conversations start. So demonstrating how we work there, that's you know, that's a, that's a central tenet of that. So whilst maintaining the the integrity and the and the the identity of a public affairs organization within a larger uh, communications organization that's that's the core for this for me you know we we need to be stronger together as a as a P, as the prca and we need to be able to differentiate ourselves within that and i think as i say we're a small group of people so we can we can take these things on quickly and we can move them forward quickly Liam, thank you well i think that that should conclude um, our, our questions uh, and the questions for the candidates. Well done, um, all three of you. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do uh, is just run through a couple of things and then we'll finish, we'll finish promptly. We're just a few minutes over. So, um, well, as I say, thank you. Thank you to uh, three candidates. This is the, uh, I believe, um, the first digital hustings for a chair election. So, uh, so that's exciting. Well done. Uh, not only is it the first, it's also the first in probably what feels like a boiler room. Well, I don't know about you, uh, everyone else, but it's certainly a very hot day here where I am. Um, so uh, well done to everybody for that. Your statements, your enthusiasm, your commitment to the industry um is uh is clear for all to see so um so thank you for that thank you to our audience for your excellent questions uh, of the candidates um we've heard emma and george's three priorities of ethical public affairs uh, the importance of being member-led and promotion of diversity 
we've heard Liam's priorities to demonstrate the role of professional lobbying in a democracy, um, the importance of actively encouraging public affairs as a career choice, and um, increasing the activity uh, for the board with the devolved assemblies in the regions of England. Members will receive uh, election ballot papers uh, this afternoon. Uh, members will have one week to cast their vote. And uh, the new appointment is scheduled to be announced next week on Friday, the 3rd of July. So, um, as I've said uh, before, this is, public affairs is a very important, very important industry. Um, the role that the PRCA Public Affairs Board plays within the industry is equally, if not more so, important. And so, therefore, the role of chair of this board is incredibly important. It is not something to be taken lightly. We have three excellent candidates, I believe, and I think it is also very good and very telling that uh, it is a contested election for any organisation, especially a membership organisation, to have a contested election um, and an engaged membership with the questions that we've had, uh, I think is a very good sign of a healthy um, and uh, functioning um, uh, membership body. So uh, congratulations, everybody. Well done for getting through such a hot digital hustings. And um, I wish you all uh, the rest of uh, a very good week. Uh, and um, Neha, is there anything that you need or would like to say or add before we finish? Um, nothing. I just want to say that I will be sending out the ballot papers this afternoon. So keep an eye out on your inboxes. And if there are any issues, just email me directly. Thanks, everyone. Good luck and thank you. Thanks, everyone.